Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Michael C. Polt and Mr. George Logotetis. Oof. Well, uh, we've come to uh, one of my absolute favorite parts of our day because uh, our latest uh, NGL cohort, 2016, and I and uh, my good partner, General Ben Frankley, had the great honor to uh, speak to George Logothetis on his home turf just uh, this last week. And uh, I'm so delighted that he has agreed to, uh, to come and speak to us today about uh, a man who really knows what he talks about when he's talking about character-driven leadership. Uh, I not only welcome him for the support he has given to our, our institute and our program, but also because he has been one of the very first hosts of, one of, our of several of our next generation leaders in his company. And uh, we, our philosophy for uh, selecting partners or asking people to partner with us, as we did with Libra Group that George leads, is to provide our next generation leaders what we call a broadening experience. So we don't take a journalist and send him directly into a news organization, or we don't send necessarily an engineer into a, an engineering outfit, but we look for people to go ahead and have an experience where they're a little bit challenged in the environment that they work in. And uh, it's a little bit hard to, uh, to, uh, to gauge that with Libra Group because they are so broad in their approach and so visionary in their approach to leadership and, uh, and to business. But uh, all of our NGLs who have been with Libra Group, and we've had them from uh, the Kurdish regional government, from Trinidad and Tobago, and from Colombia, and everybody's come, come back and saying, you know, where do I sign up for working with these guys? So uh, I'm really, really pleased that George has accepted our invitation to go ahead and talk to us today about that concept of broadening leadership, of character-driven leadership, and about the impact that you can ha make when your focus is not simply the accounting bottom line, but the social bottom line. And you heard us today to talk about conscious capitalism early in the, earlier today. I think uh, you will hear someone to speak exactly to that issue. So welcome, George, and thank you thank very, you. very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. We're very proud to be partnering with you. It's we good are. to see so many of our NGL friends in the audience as well. They're all yeah. <laughs> waiting with bated breath to see if they have yeah. learned the lessons and uh, can repeat some of your words. Yeah. Um, the very first uh, question that I have here that uh, I really think sort of can kick the uh, conversation off is uh, uh, Libra didn't start as the multinational conglomerate that it is today. Uh, let me ask you first, what motivated you to walk the path that you have walked that created Libra as it is today? It's a, it's a good first question. I would say anger and empathy and properly managing both of them. Um, so I, I started, I grew up in London as you can tell and as you know and, and my family was very much the black sheep of our community. We were looked down upon, we were not believed in um, and I didn't like that. That created anger but it also created empathy. Uh, so I knew exactly what I wanted to do from the age I can remember and I worked my summers, my winters, my Easters. My father had managed to create something out of nothing and create a small business. Um, you know, he grew up in Africa, my mother grew up in Wales. They, had, they, had, they didn't have anything. Um, and I was really angry that we were not looked at. You know, never look down at people, for you don't know what people have been through. You know, look at them or look up at them. And I learned that, you know, on the receiving end of that uh, emotion. So, um, you know, I, be I became the head of our business when I was 19. I know the website says CEO. I didn't know what that meant then. I mean, you know, it was a very small business. We had six employees. We had two old ships. But we had a waterfall of ambition to right that wrong that existed in our society. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that's when it started. I really also think it's really important to be able to almost weaponize the non-believers. You know, in some ways, the non-believers can give us more value than the believers, right? So the believers can give us confidence and love and, and unity, but the non-believers can give us motive. And what is the value of confidence and love if it's not married to some form of motive? So, you know, my brother and I, uh, after having run 
uh, shipping business, um, after my family's shipping business for 10 years, and having created you know, a shipping business with 50, 60 ships, and having learned how to make something out of nothing. How do you buy a ship without capital? How do you, you, know, how do you create something out of nothing? Um, we set up Libra in 2003. And, you know, I'll never forget, um, you know, it was a very wild idea. I mean, the idea, you know, I was on a plane, and I wrote, you know, and we had, we had done well by then. So in 2003, the shipping markets had gone up, and we had, we had made some money, and so we had the freedom to think forward. Instead of thinking minute to minute or, or hour to hour, it was, we could think years ahead. Um, and, and I read it on a piece of paper all the places in the world that we wanted to be in over the next 30 years, and next to each place put the name of a person from within our world and sent them. Um, and the common theme behind these people, they were all people that we knew. There was a high degree of loyalty, but they were also people that had suffered a lot in their lives and had really struggled and had beaten the struggle. And we, as Libra, acted as a platform to take the underdogs into ex-underdogs. Um, so one guy was into Buenos Aires, one guy was into Panama, one guy was into Russia, one guy was into Singapore. I mean, it sounds crazy. It sounds like a novel, right? <laughs> um, it sounds romantic now, with the benefit of hindsight. I didn't feel that then. Right, right. Um, but again, you know, I was 28 in 2003. My brother was 24. Um, and I went and saw a very rich powerful billionaire Greek guy to tell him this great idea that we'd had. And he looked at me when I told him the idea, and he started laughing sarcastically. And he said, don't you think that is too romantic, George? So my first reaction was anger, my next reaction was empathy, and my third reaction was thank you, because you've just given me additional motive, not that we need it anymore. But that's what motivated us, uh, Michael. It, what motivated us was to, to prove the naysayers wrong, to build something that had not been built before, to do it with a very deep social conscience, to empower the underdog, to empower women, to empower young people. We still have CEOs in their 20s in our business. Um, you know, I used to be able to say that the leadership of the group is 40 or under, and I can't say that anymore, right? But almost. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, we, we designed it to be difficult, to preserve and enhance whatever mental agility we had. Um, we had to deal with different industries, different cultures, different geographies. And, 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 but at base, we wanted to show we're more proud almost about how we've built it as opposed to what we've built. And we're also proud of what we've built, but how we've done it. I feel that we've done it in a family way, in a respectful way, um, you know, with, in a deeply socially conscious way. And, and, and in our way, in our own small way, I feel that we're redefining capitalism. That you can, you know, you should aspire for greatness, but at the same point in time, you need to inspire goodness along the way. Um, corporations in today's world have perhaps disproportionate power. Well, with disproportionate power comes disproportionate responsibility and duty. Um, you know, I happen to believe that we live, obviously, in very perhaps unstable times in the short term. But if you measure life through the lens of history, we're living in great times. I mean, you know, my grandmother was born and women couldn't vote. My mother was banned from going to university. The possibilities for my daughter just are unparalleled in comparison. Um, you know, early 60s, the president has to pick up the phone to the National Guard to have a black child educated in the same school as a white child. 1917, you get the flu, guess what, you die. 70 million people, dead. So it, it, by all uh, big picture metrics, <laughs> we're very fortunate to live in this time. Um, and I think also one other point I'd like to make is that looking at life through the lens of history does provide perspective. It can ensure gratitude. Uh, we're all a thought away from being ungrateful at the end of the day. We're all one step away from walking down the path of arrogance. So how do we ensure humility? How do we enhance humanity? How do we increase empathy as much as we can? That, to me, is effective leadership. There's an emotional element as well, a moral compass how do we ensure that the moral compass still points north if we have 10 guns pointed at our heads? So we, we have tried to redefine capitalism. We have empowered um, people that have been oppressed. Oppression takes many forms. We have the forms that are, these tragedies that are happening in the Middle East. You also have the daughter of a, a banker in New York that's being abused by the father. That's oppression. It may not be the same, but it's oppression nonetheless. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, we're... we're very proud um, of, again, the fact that the 
the, the, the social conscience comes out in, in, in a lot of what we do. You used a very, uh, and I've heard you say this before, you used the word anger and empathy, the two words I wouldn't normally put together. And anger in so many people elicits a very negative emotion that leads to very negative behavior. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about your struggle to turn that anger yeah. into an incredibly positive emotion yeah. and not let it turn you to, you know, when I get there, I'm going to show it to them and I'm going yeah. to stick it to them because you're exactly the opposite. How did that struggle work well, itself out in you? I think that's where empathy comes in as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I also think self-awareness. So I'll, I'll give you one example about how we have positively channeled anger. Um, you know, several months ago, I went to Greece and went and visited some of the refugee camps. Now, if anyone here dares to complain about the quality of life here, go and spend one day, one hour, and see the human misery, the trafficking, the, the prostitution, the enforced prostitution, the, the terrible stories that are happening there. So that's how you, I think you, 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 you know, that made me very angry, and we decided to do something about it. So the 10th social program we set up, it's called Home Project. It was set up three months ago. And the anger was managed to be channeled into, into the positive, into helping. It was partly due to self-awareness and partly due to empathy. Um, but I, I think in a sense, you know, being self-aware and measured, <laughs> is, we can't avoid being angry. I mean, we're animals, right? We're humans. We, we have a suit and a red tie, but we're still humans. We can't suppress our anger either. So I think governing it with a sense of empathy can give it meaning and purpose um, and 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 you know another time I, I you know in 2011 I I was invited to a dinner um, in New York with a whole bunch of uh, let's say very powerful people okay um, yeah because it's being recorded right it's being live <laughs> yeah it's live streaming so <laughs> all right. let's say powerful people yeah. and not go beyond yeah, yeah, that yeah yeah <laughs> yeah right. can I rewind please <laughs> um, and they were complaining and complaining and complaining about the situation in Greece. And the situation in Greece has been bad for eight years. You have, you have oppression. You know, you have a, you've had a 30% loss of GDP. You have 50% of the young people without a job. It's Europe. So the expectation is a European one. The reality is less so. So that creates a huge dissatisfaction delta, in a sense. And, you know, uh, I didn't say a word for an hour. These are wealthy people that can affect change with a sentence. And after an hour, I became so angry, I was burning up. I said, listen, you know, everyone here has got a choice. And the choice is as follows. You can either keep complaining about the problem, or we can start contributing to the solution. What's it going to be? And then I just said, and what we're going to do is we're going to set up a 20-person intern program in Greece for young kids. And this is going to be the start of our um, commitment there. Well, guess what? That internship program now takes 150 young kids a year. From, we had 53 countries apply this year. We've had heads of state ask us. Yes, absolutely. Come on. Absolutely. See him, you worked on it, right? The, the lady here right. that was an NGL right was working within our social programs on the internship program. So I've seen how it, it, you know, it, 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 makes, it, it gives people, to, it allows them to stand taller. Um, you know, you, you take kids from Greece, you send them to the United States, Haiti, to uh, Singapore. I mean, it's multinational, multi-global, and life-changing. Not just for the 150 kids that get a seat. Each young kid has got 500 friends and family and community, and it changes the community. It changes the narrative. It can give hope to the hopeless. I've seen it many times. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, my life is run by four ladies. Uh, three of these ladies are ex-interns. You know, and, and, and it's such a pleasure to see, you know, life through the lens of what is possible. You know, too much we get told what is not possible. Um, you know, uh, again, I'm sitting here with you, and, and as we were talking about the other day, my, my grandfather was in a tank in El Alamein. And then he was disrupting German installations, and he gets off a, 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 one of these boats one day with six of his friends, out comes a machine gun, kills five of them. Finished. Gone. So... Certain current freedoms have been granted to us by past sufferings. And that's why I keep saying you have to look back to understand the debt that we have to the people that have come before us. And therefore, 
the duty that we also have to people that come ahead of us, which is why we run these sorts of programs. So you say this is why you run these sorts of programs. I have uh, encountered in my uh, diplomatic career, uh, I've learned the term donor fatigue mm -hmm. uh, in an international setting. You know, countries get tired of contributing to causes. And this morning we had a panel here that I mentioned to you before we came out about uh, civil society activism or leadership, uh, do-gooders versus change agents. Uh, given how much you are engaging in your, in your uh, beyond your uh, business uh, uh, activity, why do so much? Are you ever afraid of overextending yourself in that area that you feel so passionate about? Does somebody, does one of your executives say, but you know, uh, Mr. Logothetis, it would be better if we you know, put some more money in the bank and don't keep doing all this social stuff. Uh, why, why, why go down so far in that path that you describe? Because the leadership myself, the family myself, my brothers and I deeply believe in it. Deeply. So how can you deny what you believe in? That would be a conflict at hello. Um, and the other thing is, the other point to make is that the, the highest impact often comes from the programs with the lowest cost. Mm -hmm. So the greatest gift you can give is not necessarily a million dollars or a billion drachma. It is the gift of believing in someone that hasn't been believed in. It is the gift of opportunity. It's the gift of empowerment, responsibility. You know, we're very much the empowerment model as opposed to the control model. If you empower and you, and you inject responsibility into people, it's like an injection of maturity. If you control, you just have a ceiling, right? Empowerment can be a flaw. So we, we, we believe it. Um, you know, the reasons for building Libra were not the strive for fame or fortune. It was just about being respected. It's simple, I very it. basic, I get you know? And, and if you have been looked down upon in your life, and I'm sure many people in this room have, then you know what it feels like. It's not nice. Um, as I said before, don't ever look down at people. You don't know what people have endured, suffered, gone through. Um, so it's wired into the mainframe of DNA of the leadership of our group. And the bar is high. So I'll give you one example. Um, one of our companies is a shipping company. So Libra has 30 businesses. One is a shipping business. And, you know, the one guy's job who you do not want in our world is the deputy of the shipping company. He's got 110 ships. They never call him to say things are going well. They only call him to give him problems. <laughs> 20 hours a day. The guy just works six, seven days a week, 20 hours a day. He does not stop. Every week, he finds two hours to spend with his interns. It's morally mandatory. But he doesn't do it with a grudge. He does it with a smile. You know, he, you can actually get more from being a mentor than you can from being a mentee. This is the other interesting thing that happened, is that when the interns come into our world, they inject our world with enthusiasm and energy. And it renews us in a funny kind of way. Um, you know, as I was telling you before, I think the happiest people in the world are the people that love what they do and give more than they take. And giving is not limited to money and donoring and all this. I mean, giving could be spending half an hour a week with a young kid that is lost, that is getting abused, and you can save that kid's life with some sentences. So if you, if you have the power to change someone's life with a sentence, it better be a worthy one and you better deliver it. You know? So again, it comes back, I think, to duty, responsibility, um, a sense of correctness. Um, again, looking through the history books, I mean, again, you know, well, why does my daughter born into a world where she can become president if she wants? My grandmother couldn't even vote. She was living under occupation for years. They escaped. Russia in 1917. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a different world. I loved your term, you reinvented capitalism in a way, by the way, you approached your entire approach to making money as well as doing good. Uh, you've also said in the past, you said to us in New York again last week, and that is leaders sometimes have to be unrealistic. <laughs> and uh, yeah. it's such a great term because, of course, we, uh, we have our curriculum of leadership development. We talk about focus and impact and all these various things. But so then you come, you come right out and say, well, leaders have to be unrealistic. Yeah. Give us a little bit more of a sense what you mean by that. So, uh, well, I think, first of all, Libra was completely unrealistic. 
I mean, who does that? It's crazy, right? <laughs> and perhaps the difference between madness and vision is whether you're successful or not. Right. It's a fine line, in a sense. <laughs> you know, perhaps every madman has a bit of vision, and every visionary has a bit of madness in them, right? The two are okay. kind of, it's a fine line that separates them. Um, I think, look, let's look at history. Uh, Winston Churchill comes to power May the 10th, 1940. If he had been realistic, well, why? I mean, just go home, put the TV on, and shut the blinds and go to sleep. Mm -hmm. He was unrealistic. But he was deeply vested in his sense of belief, correctness, justice, purpose, and the fact that his whole life had been about those months and years to come. Um, now, at the same time, there's also, a, you can't be unrealistic all the time. I mean, you have to, again, govern the sense of realism and, and unrealism. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go into my own life. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was two and a half, I had meningitis. And for various reasons. And this is something I never was able to talk about because I just couldn't speak it until about a year or two ago. For various reasons, until the age of 36, I didn't have an immune system that worked properly. So I had a uh, compromised immune system. I lived in perpetual fear of getting a cold. If I got a cold, then without treatment, i.e. without antibiotics, it would end in death at some point. So cold, worse cold, bronchitis, pneumonia, death. I mean, it was just simple. I had an operation when I was 36. Obviously, this is a much longer story, but I'll just give the highlights. I had an operation when I was 36 and never looked back. I get a cold, it goes away. It's like every time I get a cold, it's almost like being reborn. I'm still wired to be absolutely fearful. That, you know, my, my memories as a child, uh, white walls, hospital, George is going to die, rush him. I mean, you know, uh, I would be sick eight to ten times a year, but really sick. I would lose, every time I was sick, I would be in bed for two, three weeks at a time. I get sick now, and I need antibiotics, which happens to us. Well, guess what? I can work, I can function, I can get on a plane. I mean, I can be. I didn't grow up like that. So, and there was a whole apparatus around me. Um, we couldn't show the world, and even internally within our world, that George was effectively a weakling. It was not possible. There had to be protective perceptions put out there. Um, and, and, you know, I would use that time. I would use the time to study, because I never went to university. I left high school at 17, started working with my dad, and I never went to university. Um, now, if I'd been realistic about that whole really dark chapter for me, and I couldn't, I couldn't discuss this. The first time I discussed it was, and I discussed it publicly, was uh, in September of 15. I gave a speech at an event, and I discussed it. When I practiced the speech for the first time, I couldn't finish the speech. It was just too much trauma. Doctors, pneumonia, pneumonia, bronchitis, in bed for three weeks, antibiotics. You know, my brothers, uh, the people I work with closely, five people kind of, oh, George would just disappear. You know? Um, now, it was easier to hide things 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 than today, right? You can't hide it. Um, but th again, that was, you know, it's like, it's like, why do you go to some of the places of greatest suffering and you see some of the greatest souls that you come across. Why is it that, I was telling my friend Georgi, the Georgian guy, why is it that when I went to this, uh, this uh, disabled children's home in Greece, which we ended up supporting with a grant, there's a two-year-old girl. She can't walk. What's it, what, what has she done to this? She can't, she can't walk. But that look in her eyes is just more powerful than a two-year-old that can walk. <laughs> is she being realistic? Maybe she'll never be able to walk again. Why did FDR always believe that he was going to walk? He always believed it. He didn't. <laughs> so that sense of unrealism, I think, and or realism or balancing that out, came from those sicknesses that I went through. Um, and again, the rebirth at the age of 36, I did the operation and literally never looked back. Um, you know, empathy and uh, understanding human suffering and then weaponizing yourself to combat it in whichever way you can. Sometimes it's with words, sometimes it's with money, sometimes it's with actions. Um, but sometimes you have to, I believe, to achieve big things, you must sometimes be unrealistic. Well, we are very grateful and happy and lucky that you, uh, you have chosen to be unrealistic in that regard. Um, we live in a very, we talked about this just before we came on, populism reigns not just in the United States, in many parts of the world. We live in a very transactional world where uh, 
the deal, the immediate deal, is the thing that we, uh, that we, uh, that we focus on. And I watched in preparation of being here with you today a speech that you gave uh, at, the, um, at the American College in Greece, if it's, if it's correctly, where you received your, your honorary degree. And you used a word that I didn't know, but I looked it up, called philotemo. Mm. And uh, I was intrigued by the way you inspired this group of students, this group of graduates, with having this leadership philosophy. It's, it's not just, it, it, which goes much beyond just doing good things because it sort of is part of your DNA as you describe it. But you also, this is sort of a philosophy that drives you. Mm -hmm. And it comes from your heritage, but is deeply meaningful, I think, of course, since we take so much of our language from the Greek. So yeah. it means to us. Tell us a little bit about Philotimo from your... Well, uh, first of all, I think it's very important. Uh, the first question I believe one should ask in terms of where do you want to go is from where do I come? That's very important to understand what inherited obligations, opportunities, problems one has, either through one's conscious or through one's genetic memory, which gets passed down in some form that we don't fully understand yet. So I think that's the first thing. Secondly, philotem is a, is a, is a unique word in Greek. It, it's untranslatable in English. I mean, it, it doesn't, there's no corresponding word. Um, you know, the meaning is along the lines of the love of honor, the, the, the requirement to be decent, um, being kind without having to be, um, eliciting goodness out of people. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a quite a unique concept. And I, I'll, I'll illustrate it with a story, perhaps. Um, so go back to 2010 and you know, the Greek crisis again raging. I mean, it feels like it's been raging for a long time, right? Yes. <laughs> and it has little <laughs> sub-raging mountains. This was one of those. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully there'll be no more peaks, right? right. Um, but my brother, Con, who's the vice chairman of, of the group, uh, was in Chios in his house. And he was in Chios and uh, there was a guy working there for the summer called Fanis. And Fanis had spent eight weeks working there. And on the seventh day of the eighth week, he goes up to my brother and he says, Mr. Logoteris, can I please meet with you for 10 minutes? And my brother says, well, of course, sit down, we'll meet. He says, no, 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 I can't meet now. I need 10 minutes. So my brother says, okay, well, I'll wait for you. So Fanis goes downstairs, he showers, he shaves, he puts on a suit, he puts on a tie, gets his briefcase, and he goes and meets my brother. And, and, and my brother's like, uh, you don't expect that, right? And Fanny sits down and says, Miss Logoteris, I have worked these eight weeks in order to meet you now for these ten minutes. I, I grew up in Greece. I got myself into a U.S. college. I'm an electrical engineer. I managed to pay for it by working tables at night. My brother, Alexei, came to the U.S. and worked those tables with me to help pay for my tuition. I've come back to Greece. I have no future. I have no hope. I have no opportunity. Please give me one chance anywhere in the world of Libra to work so I can show you what I'm made of. So Con is uh, just a little bit taken aback. To cut a long story short, Fanis was given a chance. He was given a, a sort of training program in Latvia. We have some energy businesses in Latvia. He spent uh, three years there. At one point he had 45 people reporting to him in Latvia. The guy was working 19 hours a day. And then after that tr sort of training and leadership finished, he went back to Greece, and he's now in the energy company in Greece, which has got 500 megawatts of installed renewable energy in the country. Now, what's the philotimo? The philotimo is giving him the opportunity. His philotimo is repaying it with hard work. Please, categorically, absolutely. You know, it's bidirectional. It's uh, spontaneous acts of kindness um, without expecting anything in return. And, of course, we're not, uh, you can't be futilely philotimized, <laughs> right? You have to be, you have to have your feet. But, but, again, it's a way of thinking that we try and practice. Um, you know, <laughs> when I first came to the United States in 2005, I hired a receptionist, an assistant, and she was like, okay, what about my contract? I'm like, what do you mean contract? Do you need a contract? <laughs> we didn't do contracts. We did not do contracts. And it was a shock for me, because, of course, everything here is contractually done. Um, so that was our world. And still, in our world today, there are no contracts with some of the senior people. The contract of the handshake can be worth more than the contract of the letter. 
we have only a, a minute left, but I, and I'm not going to give you the chance to ask him because I have one more that I think per, pertains to all of our NGLs and I hope the rest of the audience here today. And that is, we talk a lot about, in our program, of course, developing leaders. And if ever I met an instinctive leader in my life, it was you. Oh, thank you. So therefore, tell me a little bit about your attitude toward being born with leadership characteristics and acquiring leadership uh, talent. It's, Tell us a few things it's about that. Very them. good question. I think, I think it's a bit of both. I think we are all burnt, bo born, <laughs> burnt, born with certain attributes that then get oxygenated or deoxygenated through our lives. And what does that mean? You know, I mean, you know, parenting. I think plays a huge role. Uh, there, are, there are good parents and bad parents. I mean, I see some parents that destroy their children with their words. Don't use shame with your children. They shouldn't feel ashamed. You know. Um, they know if they're doing something wrong, if they've been brought up in a, in a respectful way. Um, I think instinct is something that can be honed. I think it can be honed with meditation. I think it can be honed by reading the wise men and women of the past. I think it can be honed by cutting oneself off from the perpetual information flow that we live in today. You know, in order to have, sometimes an idea can be literally worth a lifetime's work. But if every 30 seconds we are Facebooking and emailing and the information flow is just overwhelming, you don't have the space for that idea to be born. We need to give that idea space to be born. Um, the idea to start Libra was an idea. It came at a time when I was on a sabbatical. No sabbatical, no idea. No idea, no Libra. So I think uh, you know, there are ways to hone instinct, um, to become more self-aware. Psychology, again, self-awareness, self-understanding. Which of the Greek philosophers said, know thyself? One of them, right? Well, th that says it all. It starts there. Um, so, I, I, you know, on the other hand, you know, you could have, you know, people coming from a, uh, with a very strong genetic coding um, that are totally controlled by their parents, that are not empowered, that are shamed, and they become more complicated as a result. So I think parents have a huge role in drawing out the goodness or not of their children. Um, and, um, but there are ways, I believe, to hone instinct. And also, I think that it is very important to trust one's instincts. We don't do that. You know, again, it's a cliche, but, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi is a wise guy, right? <laughs> trust your feelings. Absolutely. If something doesn't feel right, it's unlikely to be right. You know, if you are... Yeah, I think we talked about this when, when the NGLs came, but if you are having 30 sleepless nights a month, that's not good. <laughs> you know, have one to five. That's kind of a healthy, you're pushing yourself just enough. <laughs> right. When you start getting into 20, 30, Over the you're going to dilute your instincts by having over-anxiety. So I think, I think it's both and circumstance. And, you know, why is, why is you know, I'll end on one story, and I, I know we're a little bit out of time, but, you know, I, I want to say this story. It's an important story, and I think it's important... Um, for many reasons. So, Home Project, which was the, uh, the, um, the refugee program that we set up as a group, um, we built f five shelters for unaccompanied minors, otherwise known as children. You know, these are children that have left massacres, uh, killings, I mean, terrible tragedies. And, 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 you know, in some cases, literally walked to Greece. Walked to Greece. There are some stories of kids that I know that I've been told and I've met that literally just, their parents were killed, their families were killed, and they, got on, they just walked for four months to Greece. Why are they born there, not here? Bad luck, good luck? So a few months ago, a few weeks ago, there was, a, there was an email from the lady that runs this program. Urgent email. Urgent, urgent. George, there are 654 babies on the island of Samos that within 24 hours are running out of milk powder. Now, it's not like they can go and get McDonald's or Pizza Hut, right? They need the milk. <laughs> they're babies. Babies. Some of them born in Greece. They're not Greek citizens. They're not Syrians. They're nothing. They're babies. What if they, you know, to my point about where you get born and when you get born. Yes. So I responded to I said to him, right, immediately, here's 5,000 euros. You get your assistant to rent a truck. You get him to take the money to go to the supermarkets, fill up the truck with as much milk as he can with 5,000 euros. Then once he's done that, he drives to Piraeus, he gets in a ferry with the truck, goes to Samos, gives the milk powder. Within 24 hours, these children were saved. Yes. Yes. 
So forget the bureaucracy, forget the long thinking, forget the overanalyzing, just do. And maybe I'll end with this because it, it speaks so clearly to what you've just told us. And we use the, the words of Arthur Ashe, and that is, uh, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. And this man and Libra Group and all the people that work with him and for him embody that. I think it's been a, a very insightful presentation, and we're very grateful to you, George. Thank you very, very much.